Rachel, thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. We are delighted to have you. Um, we want to hear from you. We want to learn your story. You have flown a long way to be here with us tonight. What motivated you uh, to come and join us tonight? I'm just, I'm really encouraged to have this conversation. You know, the issue is of suffering and worth and identity and justice and forgiveness and, and how we know things are wrong. These are all life questions that we have to grapple with all of us have to some degree or another suffered injustice. All of us had to, have had to wrestle with forgiveness. All of us have had uh, to seek forgiveness for things that we've done. And so the opportunity to come and just to wrestle together with these ultimate life questions um, is something that's really exciting for me uh, and that I've really been looking forward to doing. Amazing. Well, I want to um, unpack some of those with you over the course of this evening. Um, I wonder if you could start by telling us uh, sort of some of the early part of your story. Um, you're a former gymnast. Tell us a little bit about your, your passion for gymnastics and how you initially got into that. Yeah, so I started gymnastics really late. I didn't get to start till I was almost 12. My family couldn't afford gymnastics lessons, so I had to start babysitting to be able to pay for my gym time. So at the point that I started, I was never gonna be anything great. I was already like 10 inches taller than your average gymnast, uh, and my body was not made for that sport. Um, so I started at, uh, at almost 12, and it was just something I loved to do. I loved the combination of mental and physical. I loved to be able to take something that looked really difficult and make it look really beautiful. Uh, I loved the life lessons that it taught me. Um, and I also really had to struggle even at that point in time through questions of how do I measure success uh, when I am clearly the worst person on the team? Okay. Uh, you know, and and to, be, to, to come out of a competition and to be content with having done the best I can do. Mm -hmm. uh, to be okay with some of the very nasty remarks that were made uh, by even people in the audience to learn how to fall down and get back up. Uh, and so I just, I loved what gymnastics taught me and I had the benefit of being raised in a really healthy gym, uh, which is unfortunately something not a lot of athletes have. Mm. I mean, you've, you've spoken quite a lot about gymnastics and the, the difficulty and the trouble that is involved at the moment within the sport. Could you tell us a little bit about, about that and, and your passion to see reform within gymnastics and sport more widely? Yeah, gymnastics is one of those sports where, you know, in, anybody who's going to be good starts very young. So you have an extreme power dynamic mm -hmm. in the sport where you have uh, coaches who really take over complete control of their athlete's life. Oftentimes these young kids will spend more time with their coaches than they even spend with their parents uh, if they're going, if they're on a track to become anything, even a collegiate gymnast. So we have an extreme power dynamic in the sport and you have extreme vulnerability in the sport. Uh, you have to get used to having your coach touch you all the time because they have to position your body. They have to catch you uh, when you're doing tricks to keep you safe. Um, and so it just creates this environment where it's very ripe for abuse to take place, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, and sexual abuse. And unfortunately, really across the board, our athletic associations have done just a horrible job um, in putting up any safeguards to these types of practices, but especially normalizing this type of behavior, particularly the verbal and the emotional and the psychological abuse. It's really become normalized in athletics, even down to the lowest level. Um, and so what you really see is instead of the sport, by and large, being something that gives children life skills, 
that builds confidence, that teaches them real metrics for success. What we're really leaving behind us is a trail of broken children because of the way that we coach. Um, and that's just heartbreaking for me, not just because athletics isn't doing what it should do, but because of the extreme damage that's being caused to our children. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you yourself experienced abuse, and that wasn't by a, a team coach, but by actually the, the team doctor. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, when you first met uh, Larry Nassar and, and what that experience was like for you? Yeah, so my first experience with sexual abuse actually wasn't in the gymnastics context. I was sexually abused at age seven in the local church. Um, and I, I really took um, some very damaging lessons from that. Uh, part, and part of what I took from that because of the way my church treated myself and my parents uh, when my parents started expressing concern about this person's behavior, uh, what I took from that was, if you have been abused, do not speak up. Because if you can't prove it, you will lose everything and just got a very good education early on about our societal and cultural response to abuse. Uh, and so by age 11, uh, I, you know, I I'd started gymnastics uh, and by about 14, 15, I was really suffering from some chronic injuries. So just chronic wrist pain, chronic back pain. I'd gone to a bunch of other physicians. They really weren't familiar with gymnastics uh, and so they didn't know what to tell me other than well, we'll just rest for a couple months, which is not an option. Um, so I had a, a couple of friends who said, you know, Larry's the, Larry's the Olympic team physician. He's the, the doctor for Michigan State University, which is one of our, you know, our big universities. He's only an hour and a half away. He treats gymnasts all the time. Why don't you go see if he can help? And so my mom and I went up uh, to Michigan State and Larry began abusing me right away in that first visit. Um, and my mom was right there in the room. And so as a young child, I didn't realize that my mom couldn't see what Larry was doing. I didn't understand how common it was for abusers to create situations where survivors uh, and victims of abuse uh, don't understand what's happening to them to intentionally create that level of confusion, that level of shock. Uh, so I didn't know that I needed to verbalize what was happening to my mom. Uh, and I didn't understand all the dynamics I was undergoing, but I did know a couple of things about abuse. And I remember thinking as I was laying on Larry's table, this is something he does regularly. There's no way the children who haven't come before me haven't described, you know, you've got all of these Olympic athletes, all of these collegiate athletes who are seeing Larry every day. There's no way somebody hasn't described what he's doing. Mm -hmm. If somebody described what he was doing, surely the adults in charge would make sure that this is valid medical treatment. Mm -hmm. Therefore, this must be okay. A very deliberate thought process. Uh, and what we now know, uh, 16 years later, is I was right on the first two points. He was doing it every day. Yeah, yeah. Many people had described what was going on in that room in graphic detail, but I was wrong in believing the institutions and authority figures who were in charge would do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that level of institutional betrayal when that came home uh, was incredibly painful to walk through. So it wasn't just Larry but also all the organizations and culture that surrounded him that Absolutely. actually didn't listen or didn't protect you and many others, is that? Absolutely. And these are common dynamics we see in abuse. We see uh, a misunderstanding culturally in our communities about what abuse looks like and what trauma does mm -hmm. uh, and what normal responses to abuse are. We see institutions, whether it's a church or an athletic association or a university or a physical community, uh, engaging in continuous patterns of not heeding red flags, not responding properly to abuse. Um, and so these are really common dynamics. Uh, and by, by the time I started really realizing what Larry was doing, I was aware of that reality. And so at that point in time, just that what really came home to me is it's not just Larry I can't trust. Mm -hmm. There's no way that somebody hasn't described this. If they have, what that means is whoever's speaking up is being systematically silenced. Um, and I really had to grapple with not just the abuse, but the level of betrayal by these institutions in the community and what it was going to take to be able to do anything about it. It really helps us to understand why uh, victims of abuse find it so hard to, to speak up because there's people who won't believe them or who won't listen or who aren't interested. Yeah, that is more often the response than not even by our law enforcement. As much as I, and, and we have, there are some officers who do a phenomenal job. I was very blessed to have one when I finally did have the chance to speak up. But again, at age 17, I was aware of the statistics. In the United States, only about every 300 rapes reported to the police result in, uh, out of every 300, only five to six result in conviction and jail time. In the United Kingdom, it's about one in every 60. Uh, so your statistics are better, 
but it's still really difficult. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, looking at it as, as a child, looking at all of these dynamics, uh, knowing the immediate cultural response I would receive, you're just out to destroy a good person, you're bitter, washed up, you want attention, there must be something wrong with you. Uh, you know, that's what all survivors hear when they speak up. It's not possible for abuse to have happened mm -hmm. the way you've described it uh, because we haven't grappled with these dynamics culturally. And so what we've created is a system where it's not safe for survivors to speak up because the only response they're going to receive, whether it's from law enforcement or from their community, is a continual re-emphasis of the trauma and the lies that they're already hearing in their head. Mm -hmm. Rachel, could you tell us a little bit more about Larry himself, about him as a, as a person from your perspective as a young, young child? Yeah. So Larry fits a lot of the patterns that we see with abusers. Uh, he was very highly educated. The most prolific abusers tend to be attorneys, physicians, uh, some of the much higher education. Uh, he was very gregarious, very engaging, uh, and he was really able to manipulate not just his victims, but the entire community around him. Uh, and we see that continually. Uh, pedophiles and predators tend to be very, um, very gregarious and engaging individuals. They tend to be very skilled manipulators. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing we typically see with abusers, not all the time, but typically see, um, is they're very skilled at creating dynamics where it appears like abuse couldn't have happened. Uh, and so oftentimes, because we don't understand as a culture and a society what abuse can look like, uh, we, we create and have the, the exact response to survivors uh, that the abuser has conditioned them to have. Mm. When a survivor speaks up, they almost always hear that's not possible because this person couldn't be an abuser, and then a list of reasons why this person couldn't be an abuser, or that's not possible because abuse couldn't happen that way. Mm. Now, if, if there was someone close to you, they would have cried out. It's not possible for you to not react. Um, and so we have these reasons why we think abuse couldn't have happened. And in reality, those are reasons that the abuser has created. Abusers understand mm -hmm. that there's not just fight and flight, mm -hmm. there's also freeze. They understand the level of confusion mm -hmm. that victims are undergoing as they experience the abuse and they create those dynamics to make it very difficult for abusers to speak up. And what we have to start grappling with as a society is when we have those responses, we've done exactly what the abuser wanted us to do. And those very dynamics that are making us go, oh, that's not possible. Those are the exact dynamics that are giving the abuser that kind of power. Mm -hmm. So you met Larry, you met him on a number of occasions, and I understand that he abused you on a number of occasions. Um, how, at what point did you realize that something was fundamentally wrong um, in what he was doing? And how did you begin to come to terms with what you'd experienced? So there was a line he crossed on my very last visit that I knew was abuse. Okay. And at that point in time, that's when the reality came crashing down on me of, this is something he's doing mm -hmm. all the time. There's no way someone hasn't spoken up. That means that whoever's speaking up is being systematically silenced. Mm -hmm. And just this cognitive dissonance of who is this person mm -hmm. who I'm in the room with? He's not who I thought I, he was. Um, and even trying to grapple with that as a survivor, I've just experienced abuse and I still can't grapple with the cognitive dissonance of who I thought he was, who he portrayed himself to be, who I was told he was, who everyone else said he was, mm -hmm. and what I've just experienced in this room. Yeah, and I also didn't understand my own trauma responses. You know, at the point in time that he crossed that line, my mom was right there, yeah. but I could not speak. I could not move. Um, and I didn't understand neurologically what was happening. And so that caused a lot of uh, guilt and shame on my part. Just did I not care enough? Did I secretly want it? What is wrong with me that I couldn't fight back? Uh, because I didn't understand the neurobiology of trauma at that point in time. Um, and so I began hearing all of the lies that survivors hear in their head, this is your fault. You should have known better. Mm -hmm. You should have seen it coming. Uh, if you really cared, you would have fought back. Mm -hmm. How could you be so stupid? Um, and just wrestling with those realities. Mm -hmm. um, and it also really caused a crisis in my faith too, as I had become a Christian at that point in time. And I had I really wrestled through, you know, what do I believe? Is there a God? If there is a God, what does he look like? How do I know that? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd really come to believe that you know, scientifically, philosophically, historically, uh, that evangelical Christianity was what was true. Mm -hmm. But then I had to wrestle with where was God in mm -hmm. this and does he care? And what does justice look like? Uh, you know, and, and, and what is my value and my worth? And where do I find that? And has it been damaged? Um, and it just, just this crescendo of guilt and shame and then wrestling with these deep questions that I just did not have answers to at 16 years old.
Yeah, so the guilt and shame that I imagine affected you in every, in every way, Absolutely. including your faith, is something that, that uh, a, a number of people wrestle with, is, is how you can possibly believe in, in, a, in a good God um, when there is so much suffering. And for you, that must have been a very personal question. Yeah, it was. Um, and I really, I did wrestle with it a lot. Uh, C.S. Lewis was incredibly helpful to me in my journey. There's this, the book Mere Christianity was very instrumental in my life. And there's this um, quote mm -hmm. that Lewis has in there that really became an anchor point for me. And C.S. Lewis wrote, my argument against God was that the universe was so cruel and unjust. But where had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he first has some idea of straight and I thought about that and I, and I realized I, I know the depth of damage that I have experienced in sexual assault. I know this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Where have I got that idea? If I can identify this as crooked, on what basis am I identifying this as crooked? I can't be identifying this as crooked based on the cultural response because here's what the culture tells me about sexual abuse. I'm not identifying this as crooked because the criminal justice system has told me it's wrong uh, because the vast majority of survivors never see justice in the criminal justice system and I did not expect to see it either. So on what basis am I calling this crooked? Mm -hmm. And that really was an anchor point because I realized if I can identify something as wrong, there must be a right. I can't identify the crooked unless the straight does exist. Mm -hmm. And that did a couple of really important things. One, it means that I can identify and I can name what happened to me and I do not have to fall sway to the pressure to minimize it, to mitigate it, to excuse it, to act like it was less evil than it was. Mm -hmm. And that means I can grieve it in ways that are non-destructive. Mm -hmm. And if I can recognize the crooked, I'm seeing the crooked because the straight does exist. And this means there's hope, mm -hmm. that there is beauty and there is goodness. And it also meant something else that was really important for me. If there is a moral lawgiver mm -hmm. who has defined crooked and straight, and gives me the, the category and the name for what I have experienced, then whoever designed this cares so much more about the crooked and straight than even I do. Mm -hmm. Which means that the ugliness that I am feeling and experiencing that I'm able to recognize and abuse, God recognizes it even so much more. Mm -hmm. And I can trust him to bring justice because he knows even better than I do what a departure this is mm -hmm. from what he has created and how evil this really is. And for some times, that's all I had to hang on to. Mm. Yeah. And there were lots of point in times in my faith journey where I would, you know, I, you know, I don't have all the answers and I'm grappling with and wrestling with how can these things exist? And there, there are these questions that I don't have answers for, mm. but I do believe this is true. And I know whatever I believe, whatever I'm not understanding, it can't contradict what I do know is true. And so at one point in time, I actually drew a Venn diagram because as you know, that's how I think. I'm very deductive. Um, for your daughter enjoys maths. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I actually drew a Venn diagram and I wrote down everything that scripture told me was true about God. Mm -hmm. He is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. He is loving. He does care about evil. He will bring justice. And I looked at that diagram and said, whatever I don't understand, these questions that I don't have the answer to yet, I know those answers cannot contradict what I know to be true. Mm -hmm. And that was my anchor point. I cannot know a line is crooked unless I first have some idea of straight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's extraordinary to hear, particularly given there were so many other authority figures who weren't um, identifying this as, as wrong mm -hmm. um, to, to have that. You, you said it didn't happen straight away, that this was a process. It's a process. Uh, it, talk us a little through that, that, that process. Yeah, so there was a, a lot of anger, yeah. a lot of shame and guilt. Um, I really didn't want to deal with how broken I was. You know, I carried guilt not just for the abuse, but also for not being able to make myself whole again. Yeah. You know, a lot of feelings of you're just you're being overdramatic. This really isn't such a big deal. If you were strong enough, you could get past this again. I didn't understand the neurobiology of trauma mm -hmm. at that point in time. There was so much about suffering that I didn't know from a physical standpoint. Um, and I wish I'd had a lot better education on those dynamics from an earlier age. Um, so I really wrestled with all of that, not just the guilt and the shame from the abuse and also the guilt and shame that I couldn't uh, get better from it. Um, and I really had to go through some of that again when I came forward. Um, by the time I came forward 16 years later, it was almost a footnote. You know, I had, I had gotten married. I had three kids at that point in time. My husband and I had worked through so much. Um, I had started talking to other survivors and being able to walk them through some of the healing process. 
And then I come forward so publicly and it's like just this band-aid gets ripped off and the trauma responses that resurfaced and the guilt and the shame that resurfaced. And I didn't want it to be that way. I wanted healing to mean that there was this final end point uh, where I get to be like I was before. Mm. And I had to learn that that's not what healing really means. Mm. Healing isn't the absence of the grief. It is knowing what to do with the grief when it comes. Mm. Mm. Uh, you referenced the point at which you began to speak more publicly about it. It was in 2016, and uh, it was an article that you noticed um, that prompted you uh, to first come forward. Can you tell us a little bit about that article and, and why you made the decision? Yeah. So I, you know, I get asked a lot, what finally made you willing to speak up? Um, and that's the wrong question because I really was always willing to speak up. When I started really grappling with what Larry had done and I disclosed to mom, it was about a year between the actual abuse and when my mom started, started really pushing for answers because she started noticing some trauma responses in me and she's like, I, I don't know what's happened, but something has clearly happened. So she just flat out asked me one day, like, you know, I'm, I'm noticing these things about you. They seem to be trauma responses. Is there something you haven't told me? She's point blank asked while we were washing dishes. And so I disclosed to her what Larry had done um, and so we started wrestling with that, what do I do now? And I was, I was 17 by that point. Um, and I said to my mom, like, if, if I speak out against Larry, I am dealing with one of our most prominent state universities and I'm dealing with their athletic program. And once you touch an athletic program, you're basically touching a deity in the United States. And gymnastics is also what makes the most money in our summer sports, which means I'm gonna be fighting USA Gymnastics. That's our national governing body for gymnastics. USA Gymnastics is underneath the United States Olympic Committee. The United States Olympic Committee is funded by the Senate. I cannot do this without taking it to the media. I cannot do it alone because I knew somebody was going to have to be able to meet Larry where he was most confident in the public square and to do it without flinching. And that there would have to be a way to take control of the narrative from these organizations. Mm. Because I knew enough about abuse by that time, I was confident we would find corruption in the police department, and we did. We would find corruption in all of these different entities. The problem was not that people weren't speaking up, it was that they were being systematically silenced. So at 17, my mom and I actually talked about going down to the local news station and giving them the story and seeing if they could get it outside of the narrative. But you know, reporting was so different back then. And at 17, I didn't know how to make that happen. And so really what I was waiting for for 16 years was an opportunity to do that. Um, and you know, so you fast forward 16 years and at that point I'm however old, 32, something like that, um, you know, married and we had three kids. Um, and it was, it was really um, completely providential, I think, that I even saw the article. Uh, the abuse in gymnastics, particularly sexually abusive coaches, was a long known fact. Uh, and it was something that people had tried to blow the whistle on many times, uh, and nobody cared. Um, but that, that particular morning, I had a teething two-year-old and a teething one-year-old and had the one-year-old baby strapped to my back. And I, was, I opened my computer to make a grocery list. And it just so happened I had left Facebook up the night before and trending in the sidebar was an article called Out of Balance. And it was written by the Indianapolis Star. And it was the culmination of a year-long investigation into how USA Gymnastics had been systematically covering up for sexually abusive coaches. And it was trending. And there were a couple of things I noticed right away. I went and read the article and it was clear to me that the journalists understood the dynamics of abuse. They understood the neurobiology of trauma and they had put together this story in a way that was actually making people pay attention. For the first time, a story on abuse in gymnastics was really trending. And the first thought in my mind was, I was right. They have been covering up for coaches. We've known that all along. If they covered for them, they're gonna be covering for Larry. And then my second thought was, this is it. This is the opportunity I've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. And so I immediately wrote to the Indy Star and I said, you know, I was not abused by a coach, but I was abused by the Olympic team physician. I have my medical records. I will come forward as publicly as necessary if you can just get the truth out. Mm -hmm. um, and I received a, just a real quick form response back from them. You know, Thank you for contacting us. We'll be in touch. And that was it. And so for the next two weeks, I felt like my life was just completely on hold. Mm -hmm. But two weeks later, I did get an email back from them that said, we had one more person reach out and they gave us the same name. We think we might be able to do something. And that athlete was not in a position where she was able to come forward publicly, but it gave them just enough where they said, we think we might be able to do something. Rachel, you said that uh, even when you first met Larry, um, you were aware that you wouldn't have been the only person who he abused. Mm -hmm. um, and it did indeed turn out that there are multiple uh, women and, and uh, young women 
you heeded abuse. Once you did come forward publicly, uh, you gave your name, a number of women felt confident to come forward. What, what changed for them, do you think? I think there were a couple of things, uh, and it, you know, and it, and it really varied among the survivor group. Uh, I sat down with the Indie Star and gave them a very in-depth interview, produced all of my medical records, uh, got some witness statements from people that I had disclosed to. There were certain things I needed Larry to respond to publicly. Uh, there were certain people that I needed to reach, um, and part of the reason I chose to go forward with my name and face is because I knew survivors are going to have to have somebody that they can relate to. They're going to have to know that there's somebody who understands the confusion and the disorientation and the grief that this person you thought you could trust is not who they really were. Uh, I talked to the Indy Star on, on August 25th. The article didn't run until September 12th. Uh, and in between, I filed the police report. I, I'm an attorney, and so when I started doing research, um, I discovered I was actually researching to see if the second victim could file a police report, because I told the Indy Star, look, if she can, I can't file the report anymore. The time frame for that has passed. But if she can file the report, please tell her, I will be the public face, I will take the pressure, I will make myself the target if she can just get the criminal process rolling. I'll be her shield if she can just go file that police report. Um, but when I went back and looked at the statute, it had undergone a change that I wasn't aware of, and it lifted the time frame, the statute of limitations, so I could file the police report. I didn't even have to ask her to do it. And so I went up to Michigan right away. We packed up the kids and the family, went up to Michigan and filed the police report. Didn't know yet if the Indy Star story was going to run, uh, but they both kind of had to be done in tandem to have a chance of it, of it going. So we filed the police report, started a, a separate kind of human resources Title IX process, and then the Indy Star story ran just a couple weeks later. And within about 12 hours of that story starting to run, the Indy Star had gotten nine calls which was incredible. Um, and it was, it was a mixture of things. So to some extent, it was, it was having a category for what they've experienced. And then for others, it was having a place to go where they knew they'd be believed because they had been telling people for years yeah. and being systematically silenced. We had both of those dynamics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you hopeful at the time that Larry would be brought to justice or, or not? To be honest, no. Uh, again, because I know, I know what the statistics are. Um, I was relatively confident in the police detective at that point in time, but there are so many unknowns in the criminal process. You know, are they going to get the warrants fast enough? Are they going to find the evidence that I'm, that I'm confident is there? Um, are they going to make any errors in the investigation that are going to lead to not being able to introduce evidence? And then you've got the question of the prosecutor. Even if you get lucky enough to have a good detective and they do a phenomenal investigation, then you've got the question of what attorney is going to try the case. Are they going to understand and have the legal skill necessary? A good majority of the time, they don't. And as an attorney, I knew that. Yeah. Um, and so it really was a process of relinquishing control again. Um, and I think that's something we really have to grapple with even culturally. You hear this, why don't, why don't survivors tell the police? If you are going to undergo the criminal justice process, it is a choice to relinquish all of the detail and the most sensitive periods and time frames of your life, the most damaging thing that's ever been done to you, and to have no voice and agency in the process. You know, as an attorney, I know exactly what needed to happen in that investigation, but I had no power to make sure those things happened. I knew exactly how the case needed to be argued. I brought a case file and a legal memorandum and laid it all out for the detective. Here's the exact statutes, here's the case law, here's how you argue this case, here's all the evidence you have, here's how you would do this, because I knew what I was fighting. But there's so much unknown still uh, that I really, I really didn't have any hope. Um, and actually, we almost got derailed even with that. You know, by the time the investigative file reached the prosecutor's desk, uh, they had found 37,000 images of child sexually abusive material on Larry's computer. Uh, but on October 4th, while I was changing diapers and, you know, and, and dealing with my kids, I didn't know that thousands of miles away in Michigan, there was a meeting happening between the local prosecutor and the police detective. And the prosecutor uh, had decided that she was not going to charge Larry for any of the counts of sexual abuse, not mine, not any of the victims who had come forward at that point in time. There were around 24 women who had spoken up and filed police reports, including a victim who was abused in a non-medical context. The local prosecutor wanted a quick conviction. She didn't want to put the time and effort and energy into it. So she was going to allow Larry to plead guilty uh, to a possession of the CSAM, which under Michigan law would have been almost no jail time. He would have kept his medical license in exchange for promising to not charge him with any counts of sexual abuse, including mine. And by that point in time, I was an international headline and it still wasn't enough. Mm. The only reason we got charges was because the police chief picked up the phone and he called the attorney general. And he said, you've got to come in and take these cases. These women deserve to be fought for. And we had an attorney general who said, I'm gonna send my best 
and he sent a prosecutor named Angela Povolitis, uh, and she took those files from Andrea, and she said, I am going to fight for every single one of them, and she did. Uh, but had all of those pieces not fallen into place, even everything I had done, including becoming an international headline, yeah. would have meant nothing yeah. because of a bad prosecutor. Yeah. And I knew that, so I, I really never had any hope at any point in time. It was just the right thing to do. Yeah. It is extraordinary thinking about uh, how many women he did abuse, mm -hmm. uh, the 37,000 images of child pornography, uh, the way that you were able to gather all the information you needed, your background in law that enabled you to uh, spot moves that needed to be made, and even still then, there were yeah. lots of opportunities for, for this to, to be missed and for him to avoid justice. Um, it is an incredible uphill battle yeah. for survivors. Yeah. Um, and that is why, you know, oftentimes they get asked, like, how did you... How did you withstand that trauma? Uh, and, and did this help you heal more? And in my case, no, it really didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but I had been through the process of asking those ultimate questions and reached a point where I wasn't dependent anymore mm -hmm. on the criminal justice system bringing me justice. And I knew that my value and my identity and my worth uh, weren't dependent on the societal response I was going to receive. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, tell us a bit more about what it is particularly that gave you strength and courage and hope to keep going, even though uh, you weren't sure or, uh, of success. It was, it was the right thing to do. Okay. And it was the first chance that I ever saw of doing the right thing. And so, I, you know, again, I had gotten to a point where I knew that my value and my identity and worth were not dependent on the result I was going to receive. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to hold on to what was true, regardless of the result that I received, um, and to also define success correctly was really important for me. You know, I think so often we give ourselves these artificial benchmarks of success, even very good benchmarks. The idea of getting a guilty verdict or stopping child abuse, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But if I've hung my value and my identity and my definition of success on reaching that benchmark, I've set up uh, really a, a, a multi-fold pitfall for myself. I can fall off on the side of uh, moral compromise. If I can just get here, I can do so much good that it will outweigh everything I had to do to get there. The end justifies the means, right. essentially. Um, and it can be really tempting to think that way when your end goal is legitimately an end goal, uh, and then become part of the thing that you're fighting. And that was something my mom always told me is, do not become what you are fighting against. Um, if you're defining success by an artificial benchmark and your identity and your value is hung on that, it can also really lead to exhaustion and burnout. Um, because so often we pursue the right thing and we fight so hard and we don't see any metric mm -hmm. of success that we can begin to ask, why does it even matter anymore what I do? Mm -hmm. What is the point? Um, so defining success, I think a more accurate definition is being faithful with what we're given okay. and knowing that your value and your identity and your worth is not dependent on this benchmark and how you define success is not dependent on an artificial benchmark. It's being faithful with what you are given. So you went through this very difficult process with uh, uncertainty over the outcome. Tell us a little bit about how it did progress. Tell us a little bit about uh, the plea deal that was given, the particular stipulations that were incredibly important in this case with Larry Nassar. Yeah, it was. It is amazing for me uh, to look back on. Um, so we had, you know, we had these moments where it looked like we were never going to get anywhere, uh, mm -hmm. and there was just so much uncertainty. Um, but we did have a phenomenal prosecutor who came in and said, I'm going to take these files and I'm going to fight for every one of them. Um, and then over the next several, several months, it was about 15 months in total, I just continued working with the press every day to push the story forward. Uh, I opted to file civil litigation eventually against Michigan State University um, and, and USA Gymnastics uh, because there was so much responsibility in those organizations. Mm -hmm. And you can maybe get lucky enough to imprison a predator. But if you don't deal with the systems that have enabled him and the cultural dynamics and the policies and the precedent, if you can't deal with those, you can't do anything about the person that rises to take that predator's place. Uh, and so I did opt to engage in institutional reform through civil justice. Uh, and I just worked with all of these different groups continually to push the story forward. And as it continued to be in the press, more and more women kept coming forward. Uh, to date, we have over 500 women who have identified as survivors of Larry's abuse. There were 10 of us that underwent the court process. Uh, I testified on the stand for about three hours. Um, and it was, that was very difficult. Um, and at that point in time, I didn't have any, time, any ability to shield 
everything that I had to stay on the witness stand from my identity. So it ended up being, it ended up being live streamed. Uh, and I, again, I really had to grapple with, um, I'm walking in defined by something that's done to me. Mm. Larry gets to walk in the courtroom defined by his credentials. He gets to walk in as a doctor. He gets to walk in with all of these things that he's done being held up as his pedigree, right? Mm. I walk in defined by something that's been done to me. It doesn't matter that I'm an attorney. It doesn't, all these things that I've accomplished, that's not what people see, they just see victim. Mm. Uh, and I had to wrestle again with where my identity comes from and is that, is that changed, is that uh, altered mm. by, by this process? Um, so I testified for about three hours under oath. Uh, in the end, we were, you know, of course, bound over to trial. And right before we were getting to jury selection for our trial, Larry said that he wanted to plead guilty to the possession of the child sexually abusive material. Uh, and so I had the opportunity to write a letter to the judge. And that was the first time I, had, I was able I had to ask that question, what is a little girl worth? Mm -hmm. uh, to write to the judge on behalf of the children that were in the videos mm -hmm. that Larry had downloaded, these little girls. Um, and then shortly after he pled guilty, he was sentenced to 60 years by that federal judge. Uh, and then shortly after that, he decided he wanted to, to plead guilty to the crimes of sexual abuse against myself and the other women. And the prosecutor, uh, she called me up. She did a phenomenal job with a trauma-informed prosecution. She said, look, um, you know, I, I, wanted, I wanna take my cues from you and for the, from the other survivors. We're not gonna do this unless this is what you want. Here are the pros and here are the cons of doing this legally. And she and I talked through you know, just sentencing guidelines and all of the legal issues that were involved in the guilty plea and the risks and the benefits. She said, but I'm not, I'm not going to agree to it unless Larry agrees to give every single survivor a voice in that courtroom mm -hmm. so that everyone has a chance to participate in bringing justice. Mm -hmm. And so she drafted up a plea deal uh, that included the right for every single survivor to participate in the process. And we were incredibly privileged to have two female judges, one in both counties where Larry was charged, who agreed to accept that plea deal. And the night before the sentencing hearing, Larry, Larry pled guilty. And then the night before the sentencing hearing where all of the survivors were going to be given the chance to speak, we had about 86 women and, and, and young girls. Some of them were still minors who had decided to speak. All but maybe four of them were planning to speak as Jane Doe's. Um, and the next morning in the courtroom, uh, one of the survivors got up and her name was Kyle Stevens. And she began telling her story and she decided to speak with her full identity. She said, I'm, I am choosing to drop you know, my Jane Doe identity and to give the world a face and a name. Uh, and months earlier when she did her uh, testimony under oath, Jacob had tweeted out, Larry forgot that little girls don't stay little forever and talked about uh, you know, Kyle's power and what I had accomplished, what she had accomplished together. Um, and she used that line, little girls don't stay little forever. And that was like floodgates opening. Mm -hmm. And one by one, almost every single one of those women stood up and said, I am choosing today to speak with my name and my identity. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just an incredible, incredible thing to witness uh, because it was, it was such a conscious decision for them to take the shame and the blame and to intentionally put it back where it belonged. Mm -hmm. It belonged on their abuser. Mm -hmm. And to, to see them able to take that step was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also incredibly crushing to see the depth of damage. And, and to, you know, Jane Doe usually doesn't have a face and a name. And it's so easy for us as a society to, to just block that image of what's really going on when you hear that Jane Doe identity. Mm -hmm. And nobody could do that in the courtroom because everybody was standing up and putting a face and a story and a childhood and a life to the trauma that they had experienced. Um, and to see all of that put out and to know that almost all of us came after the first warnings of abuse in 1997, after the first gymnast came forward and told Michigan State University's gymnastics coach, this is what Larry's doing in the exam room. And that coach held up a report for him and said, I could report this, but it will have consequences for Larry and you if I report this. That happened in 1997, long before I walked in the door, long before most of the women and little girls in that courtroom walked through the door. And to know that almost all of us could have been saved mm. was just an incredible weight to bear at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And tell us a bit more about the shift that you think has happened in culture, things like the Me Too movements, mm -hmm. um, and uh, how there does seem to be an awakening, if you like, within within society. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, I really wish the Me Too movement had happened before yeah. I came forward publicly. That would have been really helpful. Uh, the Me Too movement happened just a couple of months before the sentencing hearing. Um, and that was also, again, just really incredible to witness, to see so many women starting to stand up and say, no, that, that is also my story. Mm -hmm. um, and to see us having to start grappling with the depth and the prevalence of abuse, and then to couple that with a Nasser trial and everything that took place, and just the unveiling of what trauma really does, and the people behind the Jane Doe identities. Um, and I think we definitely have seen a shift to an extent in, in that we are seeing the need for these conversations, uh, and we're having them more, and we're having them at a more sustained level. That being said, in terms of tangible change, I'm gonna be honest, we haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. Most of these institutions and organizations, whether they are religious institutions or universities or athletic associations or physical communities, they are still not responding any differently to abuse crises. They are still not being proactive and accurately diagnosing what's gone, what's gone wrong when they have an abuse crisis. They're not being proactive in any form of restorative justice. How do we take care of the people that have been harmed? Uh, especially in the United States, our conviction rates have not gone up not an iota since Nasser. In fact, in some jurisdictions, they've actually gone down. Uh, and so we're having a little bit more reporting, but we're not having any more success mm -hmm. in catching the predators. And I think the biggest metric that we really have to examine is how do we respond when abuse happens, when it would cost to care? Because that's really the defining point. Everybody knows sexual abuse is wrong. Everybody is going to say sexual abuse and child abuse is wrong. But what happens when it's in our own community? when it would cost us to care, when it's our favorite sports team or our university or our religious denomination or our political party, something that we feel a level of allegiance to. What do we do then? Because more often than not, we are still engaging in the knee-jerk cultural response of that's different because. Mm -hmm. And I hear that all the time. I am so supportive of what you did with Larry, but what you're doing over here, well, that's different because and there's reasons why we think it doesn't matter or it's not so bad or the evidence is different when really it's not. It's just that we want it to be because if we acknowledged what we're actually seeing in our communities, it would give us a moral obligation to do something. It would cost us to care. And until we have changed that innate response, until we're willing to deal with abuse and abusers and abusive dynamics when it would cost us to care, we haven't seen a real shift. And so would you see the issues within organizations actually coming down to the individual level and a plea to us as individuals to really count the cost of, of doing Absolutely. what is right? Absolutely. Institutions are driven by individuals. Yeah. The decisions for institutions are made by individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of the time what we're seeing is there's some other goal that we find more important, whether that is a political goal yeah, I want to get my party or my candidate elected because I have all these political goals that I want to achieve. Uh, whether it is an athletic or a professional goal, uh, whether it is an academic goal, whatever it is, we have something, a religious goal, we have something that we're valuing more than the people who are paying the price for our silence or our apathy. And we can morally justify that to ourselves a lot if we choose to look at all the good, all the other good things that are being done, and we look for reasons why, oh, well, this is different. I don't have to care about it over here. I can support, you know, I, I can be against abuse over here, uh, but, it's, but it's different over here. We look for reasons to morally justify our silence. Uh, and usually it's because we value something else more than we value the people who are actually being harmed. Every decision we make, whether it is a choice to speak up or a choice to be silent, we're doing a value equation in our head. You know, we are pulling out a proverbial scale, and on one side, we're putting this thing that we value, professional advancement, academic advancement, uh, allegiance we feel to a particular political party or sports team, whatever it is, we're putting this thing up here that we value. And on the other side, we're putting the people who will pay the price for the choices that we make, and we're deciding which one we value more. And so often, we are valuing this goal that we have over here as more important than the people who are going to pay the price for our silence and our apathy and a deliberate turning mm -hmm. of a blind eye. And it's interesting that you talk about silence and apathy because uh, I wonder whether for a lot of people it's not that they are actively wanting abuse to continue, but it is more a, a silence. It is more a not standing out, not standing up, not speaking out when they could. I think we have undercounted the power of self-deception. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and the ways that we morally justify to ourselves why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and that was something that really actually stood out to me during Larry's trial. There was this, uh, during the sentencing hearing, uh, he would bring his Bible 
to the courtroom every time we had a court hearing. And when he had the opportunity to speak to the court, he would talk about all of the good things he had done. Like, yes, I might have done this step, but, but I'm pleading guilty for the healing of the community. Uh, but I am leading Bible studies. Mm -hmm. But I am giving people medical treatment in prison. That was illegal because he was stripped of his license, but hey, he was doing it and he thought it was a good thing, so whatever. You know, he would list all of these good things that he was doing. And then there came a point in the sentencing where he actually wrote a letter to the judge and said, I'm on the verge of a mental breakdown. I can't sit here and listen to this anymore. Uh, and just that reality of Larry couldn't let himself be who he was. He had to morally justify himself to himself. And he had done it so successfully for so long that he really began to believe it. But then I started asking myself the question, what if, what if I had to sit in a room and listen to everything I've ever done or thought wrong? You know, I'm not a Larry Nasser, but I certainly haven't been perfect. You know, I have injured people with my words. I've lied. I've made bad decisions. What if I had to sit in a room and hear all of the damage that I've ever done in my life paraded in front of everybody? You know, what would that be like for me? And where have I engaged in a level of self-deception? Because I don't want to be who I am. And I want to be able to morally justify every decision that I make. All of us engage in a level of self-deception sometimes. All of us sometimes don't want to be who we really are. Uh, and just that reality of the, the, the way we are capable of deceiving ourselves about the forgiveness that we might need or the wrong things that, we've might, that we might do, um, it really challenged me to be more reflective uh, on myself as well. You mentioned the forgiveness. Uh, and during your final victim statement, that was something that you personally offered to Larry. How was that possible? And what does forgiveness look like for you to offer that to Larry? Yeah, so forgiveness was a concept that I really wrestled with in my healing journey uh, because I had always heard it taught in a way that it was almost opposed to justice. If you really forgive, will you forgive and you forget? Uh, and and you, you never talk about it again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you release the person from all consequences. Uh, and I really struggle with that because intrinsically we know that that's, that's not right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, saying, saying, I'm sorry, does not erase the damage that's been done. Uh, and forgiveness does not mean an erasure of the consequences. Often it's not safe uh, to erase the consequences of what's been done and it doesn't make it okay. Mm -hmm. But I had been taught forgiveness in a way, and I think culturally we often understand forgiveness in a way that it's almost opposed to justice. And then looking at scripture and seeing that God promises to bring justice. You know, and so oftentimes we think of God's punishment of sin as it's taught in scripture as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but in reality, isn't that, don't we intrinsically know that a judge who is loving cares about the bad things that have been done? Don't we intrinsically know that the most unloving thing we could do is to act as though something that's really terrible isn't terrible at all. Mm -hmm. And so when I started to study the Bible and, and looked at how scripture actually taught the concept of justice mm -hmm. and this idea that God brings justice for those who have been harmed, what I realized was forgiveness is releasing my personal desire to harm Larry. Mm -hmm. It is not releasing the, the depth of damage that's been done, it's not pretending like it wasn't terrible, it's not minimizing it, and it's not releasing him from the consequences mm -hmm. because God has promised that he's bringing justice. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that allowed me to extend that level of forgiveness to Larry, realizing that it was a personal decision and it did not absolve him mm -hmm. uh, and it was not dichotomous to justice, mm -hmm. uh, but it was a path. It was definitely a journey and a path to get there. Mm -hmm. Yes, because we often see justice and forgiveness as opposing forces. Right. And indeed, you did uh, plea for him to get the maximum sentence that was, that was available. Um, so there was that firm pursuit of justice, and yet at the same time, uh, an offering of personal forgiveness mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, and you know, I think when I examined, again, just as part of my faith journey, when I examined other models for forgiveness, other religious theories of forgiveness, agnostic, atheistic theories of forgiveness, there really isn't another model out there that grounds forgiveness in the concept of justice. There's no way to do that. If you don't have a God who is bringing justice for the wrong that has been done, you don't have anything but a forgiveness that says, well, he said the magic words, I'm sorry, I have to release him. 
you know, there's no other framework that can hold in tension this concept of justice and forgiveness uh, by, by bringing a moral lawgiver who is going to bring justice. And yet in the Christian faith, we're also taught that God is a God of mercy because he has offered to take that eternal justice upon himself through the sacrifice of his son. But either way in the Christian faith, justice is always done, even if Larry truly reaches a point of repentance, and I don't believe he has yet, even if Larry reaches a point of repentance, it does not erase the consequences and it doesn't mean that justice isn't done. Rather, what I believe is if he accepts Christ's forgiveness, then justice was done by a God who willingly stood in his place and received the punishment he should have received. But justice is always, always done. And that sacrifice that we, that we see in the Christian faith of Christ on the cross, um, what that really communicates is that it is so serious, the depth of evil, the depth of evil that was done to me is so serious that God himself gave his life. Um, and and that, that holds intention, that justice and forgiveness, and it creates a framework where forgiveness and mercy are possible because it is rooted in eternal justice. And there's no other framework like that, even though intrinsically we know, you know and, and even the way we, you know, we raise our kids, you know, if, if you distill down concepts of forgiveness and justice to our children, we know that saying the right things doesn't erase the damage. Uh, you know, and, and we tell our kids this all the time. I've got four and they're 10, seven, six, and three. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity to talk about wise decision-making when you have four kids that young, all crammed in a house together. Because uh, kids do a lot of things during the day and a significant amount of it isn't smart. Um, so we have a lot of opportunities to talk about that. Um, and so, you know, if, if one of my kids harms one of my other children, you know, whops them on the head and takes their toy, that kind of thing. Um, you know, one of the first things they do is, I'm sorry. Like, I'm glad you're sorry, but sorry does not make your sister's head stop hurting. Sorry does not erase the consequences of what you've done. And I, I require them to walk through a process when they're ready of actual repentance, identifying what they did wrong. I am sorry that I hit you on the head and I took your toy. Identifying the damage that's been done, that I harmed you, I hurt you, and I didn't respect your property. And then asking the question, what can I do to make you feel better? How can I repair this relationship? Because we know, and we even teach our children, saying the words, I'm sorry, does not make the consequence go away. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, we see this, this tension of justice and forgiveness. When my child says, I'm sorry, I hit you, that doesn't mean that they don't get a time out mm -hmm. or there aren't consequences on their behavior. Uh, so we know that forgiveness is not a concept uh, that is opposed to justice but rather it's a concept that's rooted in justice. We intrinsically know this. Where does that framework come from? Uh, and for me, I believe it comes from, from the Christian faith because that's the model that we have in Christianity uh, is a model of justice and forgiveness being held in tandem with each other and forgiveness being rooted in the reality that justice is always done, yet mercy is possible because God has offered to take that justice on himself. Rachel, you... Um had the right uh, privilege of seeing your abuser come to justice. Uh, yet for many survivors, they don't have that opportunity. What would you say uh, to people in that situation? It's heartbreaking. I mean, that is a heartbreaking reality. Um, and, I, and I look back at the first 16 years where I really never believed that that was gonna happen. And the journey that I had to go through uh, to become okay with that and to find my value and identity outside of that. Um, and again, the, you know, the, the hope that I had and all I had to cling to at, at point, various points in time was that concept of C.S. Lewis, this crooked and the straight. Where had I got the idea that the universe was cruel and unjust? I know something is very wrong. Mm -hmm. How do I know that? Because a man does not know a line is crooked unless he first has some idea of straight. You can name the abuse and you can know it is wrong and you can tell the truth about that and you do not have to minimize it or mitigate it or excuse it or pretend that it's less than it is because the straight line really does exist. And I do believe that there is a moral lawgiver who cares about that straight line. He created it for a reason. Um, and I do find great comfort in the hope of God's justice um, and that reality that he has promised to come back on behalf of those who have suffered. He has promised to meet out justice. Uh, and so oftentimes I actually, with, with survivors, we, we read through the book of Revelation 
because it portrays Christ coming back and, and the visual imagery given, it's, it's an analogy, but the visual imagery given is Jesus Christ coming back with a robe dipped in blood, showing the sacrifice he's made for our sins, but bearing the sword of justice. Uh, and I say to survivors, this is how much God cares for you. He is coming back because you, his son, his daughter, have been so deeply wounded and he cares and he is coming back to mete out justice. And he is coming back with a robe dipped in blood because he has taken justice upon himself for those who repent, but he is going to bring justice for you. And sometimes that's, you know, that, that is an eternal hope that we have. Um, but it is, it is an incredible comfort to know that that is coming um, because what was done to us was evil and wrong and it deserves justice. Your work isn't done. Uh, you have continued to uh, pursue advocacy uh, for many survivors um, and also a pioneer institutional change. Tell us what life has been like for you since then um, and what keeps you uh, pursuing justice. It's busy. It's really busy. <laughs> Uh, we had a fourth child. I was carrying my fourth child when I gave my victim impact statement against Larry. So we had a fourth baby a couple months later. Uh, and her middle name is actually uh, after the detective who did my case. Her middle name is Renee, and it means redemption, uh, which is just incredibly meaningful uh, to me. But we did, I did make a conscious choice, my husband and I, to engage in full-time advocacy work. Uh, and so that's taking a variety of forms. You know, I am a trained attorney, and so I do do some legal work. I have background in public policy, so I've been involved in legislative work. I work with a lot of nonprofits and universities. I do a level of crisis management. Uh, there are not very many organizations that ask the question, what do I actually need to do, and want to hear the answers for what they need to do when they have a crisis, but there are a few. And I do a lot of work in the church space, uh, because the reality is the church has handled sexual abuse and domestic violence absolutely horribly, historically. Um, and that just breaks my heart. Uh, I find that they have wielded theology very incorrectly. They have used the Bible like a weapon instead of like a refuge. And there is a long history in faith-based traditions of covering up and mishandling mm -hmm. sexual and domestic violence. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I do a lot, a lot of work in the church space, trying to help the church handle this better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the um, sort of highlights of your work over the past few years? Have there been some encouragements in this area? Yes, slowly, very slowly. Uh, we are seeing some shifting. Um, USA Gymnastics did eventually settle their case. We were able to reach a settlement uh, just a couple of months ago that I hope we'll be able to get some of these women some significant medical help and therapy for what they've been through. We're doing uh, some, some encouraging work in the church. There's definitely an awakening mm -hmm. uh, among pastoral staff in particular to realizing the depth of damage that's been done. Um, and so it's starting. It's starting, but it's very slow, and there is so much left to do. Uh, and really the key factor for all of these organizations is gonna be what happens at the community and the ground level. Is there going to be sustained pressure, for lack of a better word, in these organizations, it, these congregants, these gymnastics coaches, are they going to keep saying, we will not feed an abusive structure, you have to tell the truth, we have to have transparency and accountability, or is this just gonna be something that fades into the background? Mm -hmm. What happens on an individual level is going to drive the institutional reform. Well, Rachel, we are so grateful for all that you're doing. You are certainly being faithful uh, with what you have been given. Um, thank you for the way that you have spoken up for those who don't have a voice and the way that you continue uh, to do that at great personal cost. We applaud you, we honor you, um, and we want to join you on your journey. Um, so, Rachel Den Hollander, thank you for joining. <laughs>